We're glad to be in the house of the Lord today, continuing on with our series, uh, Thanks and Praise. Uh, Last week, we uh, started off with Psalm 100, uh, looking at the reality of how God calls us to be a thankful people and really center our hearts on the Lord. Today, we're going to continue on in this series. We're going to look at uh, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians. Now, Thessalonians is not a book that you go to often, uh, but it is in the Bible, uh, 1 Thessalonians. Uh, so we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, and we're going to only look at, uh, for time's sake, because I have enough time, uh, we're going to look at verses 12 through 21 only. Verses 12 through 21 only. If you're looking for it in your Bible, it's Philippians, Colossians, then 1 Thessalonians. All right? Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians. It's right there in the word of the Lord. Whether this is your first time with us, thank you for joining us today. I know it's uh, cold today, um, and you know what that means in New Orleans. It's like you're not getting out of bed, right? But thankful that you got out of bed this morning and actually came to uh, worship the Lord uh, because it will be cold on Monday, and you're still going to go to work. Amen. All right. Leave it at that. All right. Would you stand with me one last time as we read God's Word together? We look at verses 12 through 21, 21, or 22, actually. So this is the word the Lord says to us. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you, and to regard them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we exhort you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle, comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See to it that no one repays evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for one another and for all. Rejoice always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Don't stifle the spirit. Don't despise prophecies, but test all things. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil evil. Amen. This is the word of God for the people. God, you may be seated. One thing we can say about the early church is that they loved Jesus. In fact, loving Jesus was the cornerstone, the hallmark of the early church. They loved Jesus. They loved one another, and they stood against false teaching. And churches like those in Thessalonica longed for the return of Jesus Christ. In fact, we often hear much talk about the end times, but it's often focused on figuring out how things will come about instead of how the New Testament actually teaches about the end times is that it teaches about the return of the Lord that we're called to live in light of the coming of things. What that means is that we are called to live here and now as we wait for the coming of Christ. We're called to live in a manner that gives him glory with our lives here and now. And we find here is the end of a letter to a faithful church, a godly church, a young church, that they're being encouraged to continue to press forward to live for God's glory in light of living in the last days. Now, this church was planted by the Apostle Paul on his second missionary journey. We can find this in Acts 17. As he proclaimed Christ in Thessalonica, Paul preached the gospel to Jews first. He preached there in the synagogue first. And many came to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet it wasn't just Jews who came to the faith in Christ. It was God-fearing Greeks. And it was uh, those who were Greeks as well who came to know Jesus. And the church was formed. Now, as the church blossomed, Paul was concerned about them and sent Timothy, his young protege in the faith, to check on the church and to build them up. It was from Corinth that Paul wrote uh, his letter to encourage them. So uh, 1 Thessalonians was actually written before Corinthians. This is important because this is one of the first epistles we see that Paul writes to the church. And it wasn't that they were having major issues, although he does address a few things But he writes because he loves them as brothers and sisters. And he desired for them to stand firm and live a life of thanksgiving to the glory of God. So the very last words of this letter are really an exhortation. It's an exhortation for them to live as Christians, to live as Christ's followers, and to live in the body 
among one another, lives that would be to the glory of God until Jesus returns. This is very practical to us today because the same words here can be applied to us as well. Now, you may ask, well, where is the church at Thessalonica now? Gone. Just like every church planted by the Apostle Paul. Just like this church will be one day as well, completely gone off the scene. You say, man, that is very pessimistic. Well, no, that's the reality. The reality is The kingdom of God will never go away, although local expressions of it will. Every church has a lifespan. It's planted and then it dies. But yet the kingdom of God goes on forever. His people will live with him forever. And so Paul then writes to them these encouraging words. And the first thing we see here is that he says, look, recognize and honor your leaders. Again, verse 12, now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you. Now, the early church was very thankful for their leaders. They were actually uh, encouraged and admonished to submit to the authority of their leaders. We see this throughout all the epistles. And when we see this high character or the high character qualifications for those who are in the office of elder as well as deacons within the church, these should be people and men that we're thankful for and thankful to follow. Yet not just even these offices, they had other leaders in the church as well who were leading out to the glory of God. In the early church, they were evangelists. They were uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord who served the Lord well and served God's people. See, we don't just simply follow a leader because of the office alone, although that does play a part into it, right? Someone is in the office of an overseer, an elder, a pastor, right? The synonymous, and you're saying, man, I want to follow this person because they're in that office. Yes, that is a part of it. But look at what the text says. We're called to give recognition because of the labor of them, because of the labor of how they lead you in the Lord and admonish you. So we simply don't follow because of the office, but the labor and the character of the leader as well. Now, get this point. There are indeed bad leaders, but not every leader is a bad leader. Let me explain that. I think, and, and, I, and, I, and I say this, and I say this, and I, and I hear my heart on what I'm saying and I'm about to articulate. Many of us have experienced bad leaders in the church. So then what ends up happening, you take every bad leader you experience and you put it on the next one. So what ends up happening, you find a godly leader who's not perfect. They don't lead perfect all the time. They don't get it right all the time. They get on your nerves sometimes. They may even rub you the wrong way. They may preach something you don't like sometimes. But then all of a sudden, you begin to lump every person in with the horrible leaders you've experienced. The reality is that it's unfair. Because what ends up happening is that churches like ours, that we attract people, and again, we attract people who come here who've been wounded. And they've been wounded by prosperity teaching, false teaching, all these things, and they end up here. Praise God. That's awesome. We love it because that's the background I'll come out as well. But what ends up happening is that when you get in a setting like this, in a body like this, where we're striving to be godly, striving to do the things of God, we don't hit it all the time, but what ends up happening is that you have more sitting than doing. Say, you know, man, I can't give because, you know what, I remember what this last church did. Or I can't build relationships with other people because I remember how this, or, you know, I can't can't get close to this pastor because I remember how I was wounded by this one. Well, that's what they did. You should make sure you're going person by person. Why? Because you want people to treat you that way as well. You want people to see what you're doing, see your character, and treat you according to that. So Paul is saying here, look, don't just follow because of their office, but look at the labor and look at their character. Godly leaders, again, aren't perfect. They make mistakes, and they don't make decisions perfectly all the time. Godly leaders don't always have every trait you would want. Some may be more charismatic, some may be more dynamic in their speaking, yet what is the criteria here? It's their labor. In fact, 1 Timothy 5, 17 says this, the elders who are good leaders are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. 
You know, I don't know, you know, and this is not, take me out of the equation. I'm just saying, when you find a good godly pastor, good godly leaders, when someone's laboring to teach well, they're not just waking up on Saturday morning and saying, wonder what the Lord wants me to say today. Now, some people are like that. I've been to churches like that, where they say it's a Saturday night special. They just kind of, which way is the spirit leading? And then all of a sudden they get up and they just go on and be like, what are you talking about? You're not even in the text. What are you saying? I would say on average, if you find somebody's going to labor in the text and really labor, especially if they write manuscripts every week, try writing single space, eight pages every single week to turn in and to be critiqued. But not only just on Sunday, but on a Wednesday as well. That's just, that's just preparing. I'm talking about that's just preparing a message. That's not just taking on account counseling, meeting with people, leading the church and all the business things that need to be happening. No. Godly leaders aren't sitting on their hands. They are laboring. And every godly leader, guess what? They may not have a big social media following. They, as a matter of fact, they may not need those things. And so the Apostle Paul, he writes and says, recognize. This word here can be translated as honor, right? Honor. Hebrews 13, 7 says this. Remember your leaders who have spoken God's word to you as you carefully observe the outcome of their lives. And look what it says. Imitate their faith. See, many of us have brought hook, line, and sinker that Good godly leaders are those who are the most charismatic and those who have the biggest following. Many of us have brought in that, guess what? A godly leader, guess what? It's the one who can attract the most people and move you the most with their charisma. But yet what we see here, and I'm just going by the text. I'm not going by anything else. This text just says here, carefully observe the outcome of their lives. The sad reality is, in the, especially in the American church, and now especially in the church in Africa and different places because it's been exported from here, everywhere else, we will look not at the character of any leader. They can do what they want. And still retain a large file. Oh, you know what? You know, it's just. And again, we're not talking about. The, yes, there is grace. That is true. We're not saying that. And I'm not saying there's not there because we're not talking about perfection here. But here's what I'm saying. If a man has had an indiscretion, and we're not talking about, man, okay, look, you sit down for a while, you're going to restore you because we want everyone to be restored. But if you got a baby mama over here, baby mama over there, and then now you're leading a huge church over here, and then everybody's still following you, something is wrong. Something is not right. And, I, you know, my heart breaks for a lot of godly leaders because there are got a lot of godly pastors who the reason why they want to quit is because they don't feel honored at all. And you say, oh, they just need to get over it. This is what I'm saying. Take me out of the equation. I'm talking about myself. I'm saying there's times where there's godly leaders. And because of how we've been wounded by other false leaders, we treat godly leaders like trash. Man could be living his life right, loving his family well. You've seen the outcome of their life. You've seen their faith walked out. You've seen how they're suffering. You've seen how they're pouring out. And it'll never be good enough. Because you don't preach like this one. Ah, the sad reality is that many people go to church Sunday after Sunday and have a faithful, godly pastor, but won't even act. I listen to your sermon on Sunday, but throughout the week, I ain't doing nothing else with you. Because I got T.D. Jakes, I got Jamal Bryan, I got T uh, Stephen Furtick, I got this one, I got that one. And your YouTube is just filled with that. But yet you got a godly leader and they're pouring out week in, week out, preparing in the text, trying to pour out. And it's like, you know what? I'm staying my behind at the house. Not talking about me. I'm just saying that's the reality of many pastor friends I have. And many people I talk to. Now, who should do this? Brothers and sisters, those in the body of Christ. And there's a lifestyle in the body when it comes to those who serve us and the Lord as well. These leaders are those who labor and those who instruct and teach you. So giving honor is not putting on a pedestal. 
It's, it's giving due respect. It's, it's, it's giving thanks to the Lord from whom God has given us to teach and instruct us in the word of God. Now, there's nothing wrong with a pastor having, you know, hey, look, got a parking space. You know, we sit up here and stuff like that. We don't do that here. It's not because we don't, you know, say, you know, it's sinful, but I sit with y'all. I don't need a chair up here because I'm one of y'all. I've been called out from among the body to lead in this way. But this is what maturity comes in as well. We're called to honor, recognize and honor leaders. I have a pastor that I'm really close to, and he's retired because of cancer. And I texted him the other day. I said, man, I just want to tell you, I really appreciate you and appreciate your service to the Lord. Man, I I love that brother. I love other brothers in the Lord, and I want to honor other men of God who have laboring well, whether their church is small, big, great, whatever. Because every pastor is not a false teacher. Let me debunk this right here. Not every pastor is rich. I don't know where we get this from. I don't know why we take what the world says, and then we walk in it as well. They say, oh, you know, man, them pastors, all they want is your money. What? What, what money? Because there are many pastors who, they, they don't make a lot of money. They're living just like each one of you. So we have to begin to say, you know what? We want to give honor to those who labor well. If you have elders in the church that are laboring well and teaching and preaching and those things, guess what? Honor those brothers. But then guess what? It's not just stopping there. You're you're called to help your brothers and sisters. Look at verse 14. It says, and we exhort you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle, comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See to it that no one repays evil for evil. Now, people often make the assertion that the work of the ministry is only for the leaders in the ministry. So we pay those who are on staff, and guess what? We pay them, they do the work, and then we benefit from it. But it is not that way according to the Bible. The scripture says this, the role of the elders, the role of the pastors and leaders, it is this, Ephesians 4.12, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, to build up the body of Christ. That is the goal. The goal is to build up the body of Christ, to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. So the question could be asked is that, man, when are we equipped? Well, we get equipped here, right? But then we also have connect group that happens. We have a equip class that happens in the morning. We got a connect group that happens right after service. We got a young adult group. We have a Wednesday night equip time that we have every week. You say, why do we have to do that? Because I have all these other things in my schedule. I don't need one more thing because we need to continually be growing and being equipped to grow in our faith in the Lord. So if you've not availed yourself to these things, I want to encourage you to avail yourself to these things, right? You say, man, I don't know what well, work it into your schedule. Find what works. If you can come early in the morning, guess what? Go to that group that meets in the morning. If you can't do that, go to the one that meets after church. If you say, man, I can't do that, find a time. Come on Wednesday. We have students that takes place on Wednesdays for, for uh, uh, teenagers from junior high to high school. Avail yourself to that. I just want to say, if you can say, guess what, a a local church is giving you ways to grow, take advantage of those ways to grow. It is going to be inconvenient because guess what, there's never a good time. There's never a good time to read your Bible, never a good time to pray, never a good time to witness. But guess what we have to do? Make sure we align our lives around those things. We get equipped not for the pastors and leaders to hear themselves, Not so that they can labor more in the word. No, so that the saints can be equipped. Why? Because when we go out into the world, we want to be able to say we know what we believe. We can firmly stand on the word of God and move in it to the glory of God. Why? Because it's not just the pastors who do the work. It's your brothers and sisters. You have a job to do as well. So the apostle Paul gives this admonition. He says, be be at peace among yourselves. We have to strive. That's what is giving this idea of striving for peace with each other. And we're working towards this. We're living at peace with each other as much as we can. So you say, man, who is in control of if we have peace in the church? Raise your hand. Use. Uses. 
Don't look at, don't look at Loretha and them who, if they, no, 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 us. If there will be peace in the church, it's up to you and I to strive for it, to labor for it. He says, look, we should have peace among us and, and strive toward that. But then he goes on to say, brothers and sisters, look, warn the idol. Now, why do we have this command? Well, many were looking for the immediate return of Jesus. There was nothing wrong with that. And some had the idea, well, if Jesus was coming, then guess what? We just wait on this, right? How do we know this? Well, 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 through 12 says this, to seek, seek to live a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, so that you may behave properly in the presence of outsiders and not be dependent on anyone. While there's a reality of interdependence that we have on one another and dependence on the Lord, there is this reality that each one of us should be working towards being dependent in our work. Well, we're saying, you know what, if I do need help, it's because I have a dire need, not because I, A, don't want to work, or B, am not trying to take care of my own self. So we're called among the world that we live in is to live in a way where we're not causing up strife, causing up confusion, but we're called to work with our hands. We're called to live peaceable and quiet lives to the glory of God while we await the return of Jesus. Paul had to bring this even more to light when he wrote to them again. When he says this in 2 Thessalonians, because they didn't get it the first time, he talks to them about how he heard that some of them were still idle, that they were not busy, but they were busy bodies. And look what he says. He says there in 2 Thessalonians, now we command, and this is in uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, now we command and exhort such people by the Lord Jesus Christ to work to work quietly and provide for themselves. So work is unto the Lord. And work is something we can give praise and glory to God for. So work quietly for yourselves. But as for you, brothers and sisters, don't grow weary in doing good. So he's encouraging them. Look, if you find a brother or sister among you that is idle, that is not working with their hands, that is not living the way that they're called, guess what? You're called to go to them. You're called to be in their lives. You're called to actually be among them so that you can give them this exhortation. So he says, look, we exhort you, brothers and sisters, one of those who are out of. And then look, it says, comfort the discouraged. Comfort the discouraged. Let's go back to that idleness piece real quick before we move on. Now, this idea of idleness was often applied to a soldier who would not keep rank, but insisted on marching their own way. As a Christian, there is a certain way we should live. We should behave. We should govern our lives. And the question you could ask yourself, who has the right to check you? I was just going to ask him one more again. Who has the right to check you? Another brother or sister in the Lord. You say, oh, hold on. Oh, whoa, 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 hold on. I don't need nobody checking me. I don't need anybody telling me anything, but that's part of our problems. We want to live so independent that we don't have dependence on one another. Dependence on one another, that means that another brother or sister can come into your life, and if they see something, they can help adjust your self-perception. But the only way that could happen is if you have relationship with one another. And that's when things get messy, as we're going to see in a second. Love loves enough to tell the truth to another brother or sister in Christ. And this doesn't seek to destroy them, but build them up. Early on in my marriage, I had to learn that I needed to stop lying. And he said, man, you're lying about money, you're lying. No, 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 no. I would lie to spare my wife's feelings. Now, nobody else does that. I know you never lie at all. And my wife would always ask me something, and she would ask, like, you know, you like this? You're like, oh, baby, it looks awesome. Oh, baby, oh, yeah, it looks good. And I'm just lying. I'm like, I don't like it. It looks bad. I was like, if I say this, it's going to hurt our feelings. <laughs> Until one day, the Holy Spirit was like, you are a good liar. <laughs> you lie about everything. 
But I did that to other people too. People pleasing will always leave you lying more than being truthful. You want to know why? Because you, you, it, you do value the relationship, but it's not that you value the relationship. You begin to set that person up with more esteem than the Lord. And that is a problem we have in the church. We come into this place and we come and we understand because we're so, we come into a place in the body of Christ and we understand we should love one another. But sometimes our love is just so fragile. And this is what I mean. Many times when someone's corrected, told something about themselves, and I'm not talking about in a mean way, I'm in a very loving way. You know the next thing they do? I'm gone. I'm gone. You don't tell me nothing. You don't tell me. But man, I'm not, I'm not. I never forget had a person one time get in my face and point the finger in my face and just like arguing about the scripture. And I was like, man, nah, like you wrong. You are wrong. And they left. I didn't tell them to leave. I didn't want them to leave. I would love for them to not leave. But that is the reality of sometimes what happens. Why? Because I'm not seeking, we're not seeking to destroy one another. We're seeking to build one another up. And this is what he says here. Look, comfort the discouraged. Comfort the discouraged. Many among us are struggling. And oftentimes, you know, we're, we're, it's, we're walking through things and we're having hardships in life. But this call here is to draw closer not only to the Lord, but to another brother and sister in Christ. But how do we know? How can we know the reality of someone being discouraged? Well, when you have a relationship with them. The reality is, if, if we had a normal Sunday, right, and everybody showed up here, I mean, we have 200 plus people here. It is no way possible I could have a deep, intimate relationship with 200 plus people. Me, by myself. I, I've just given up on it. I can't. And I'm not trying because I'm not Jesus. But if the body is working well, then that means brothers and sisters have relationships with one another to care and comfort when those who are discouraged as well. Some of us are discouraged and we walk through discouragement alone. Some of us walk through discouragement because of how we've been taught. Some of us have been taught the pseudo and fake Christianity that says, if I confess that things are well, they will always be well, and I must never let anyone know that I'm struggling. If I just keep positive enough, it'll go away. The chances are it's not. Some of us need someone in our life to adjust what we're seeing about God and ourselves. But the truth is, many of us don't trust anyone enough to even let them in. I was like that for a long time, especially leading. I don't want anyone to think I'm incompetent. I don't want anyone to think I don't know what I'm doing. But the truth is, a lot of times, I don't know what I'm doing. There's many times I'm like, I have no idea what to do. And this is why you have other brothers in the Lord that I can go to and say, hey, what is your thoughts on this? Am I wrong or am I right? And guess what? Humility would say, I don't know. And guess what? If that other brother in the Lord knows better than I do, praise God. We need to humble ourselves. And many of us have not invested enough within the body. Or we have a negative view of relationships in the church that we don't take the opportunity to build new relationships. Why? Because here he says, look, we're called to not only comfort the discouraged, but we're called to help the weak. Help the weak. So the discouraged, we aid and we say, keep going. But the weaker brother, we come alongside and say, look, let me help you in your understanding of certain things. In fact, how do we know this? If you go read, I believe it's Romans 14, Paul deals with the idea of those who are weak. And he talks about those who are weak because they were getting tripped up on food that they couldn't eat and couldn't do this and couldn't do that. A lot of times what we see, and we would say is strong, oftentimes is weak. In a sense of like this, not saying that they're less than, but they have a lot of legalities in their lives. 
can't do this, can't drink this, can't watch this, can't do this, can't do this, can't do that, can't do that. Many times the weaker brother does not understand the freedom they have in Christ. So usually the Greek Christians, as Warren Wiersbe said, I love this, they are afraid of their liberty in Christ. So they live by only rules and regulations. In fact, in the Roman assemblies, the weak Christians would not eat meat. They held onto the Jewish system of holy days. They were severe. Listen to this. They were severe in their judgment of the mature saints who enjoyed all the food and all days. What does this look like? And again, I say this in jest, but I'm going to give you a real practical way this looks like. And this is not knocking anyone. I'm just showing you what this looks like practically sometimes. You got a Christmas tree? Oh, I know you a pagan. I know you a pagan. I just know. I knew it. I knew it. You up there worshiping idols in your house. Bless you. Bless your heart. That's what weak brothers look like. Now, the mature, we don't flaunt our freedom in that sense, but we begin to help. You know, let me take you along and, and show you some historical things. Let me take you in the Scripture and take you to Jeremiah and show you what it teaches. That, man, there's freedom and liberty in Christ. You see what I'm saying? And there's much of that in the church. And we have to help our brothers and sisters in that aspect and see what he's building on us here. Someone who's strong and mature were called to help the weaker brother who may not truly know their freedom in Christ. And guess what he says? In all this, be patient. I know everybody in here is like so patient all the time. Especially those with little kids. You're so patient all the time. See, it's easy to look at many of these areas in the church and look at brothers and sisters in Christ and it's easy to just get short with them. But the truth is, The same way Jesus meets us right where we are, we're called to meet brothers and sisters right where they are as well. We're called to help brothers and sisters along and give thanks to God that we're called to do that. Patience is called for, long-suffering. And the question for many of us is that how often do we give up on the church, give up on brothers and sisters because we've been impatient? I remember first starting the church plant when we first started, and we had people come along, and they were journeying with it for a little while, and then all of a sudden they were like, nah, you know what, this is not for me. And I get it. Being a part of a new church and stuff like that is very hard. It's very difficult because you got to deal with all the things that are growing. But guess what? Sometimes it does take patience to just sit and wait, to sit there and walk with somebody. You know the patience the Lord shows you? It's the same patience he wants you to show another brother or sister in the Lord. Not talking about them, not giving up on them, not not talking down, but saying, let me walk with you. Let me love you as Christ loves. So instead, brothers and sisters, we face these real body issues. And even when people do us wrong, we're not called to be like the world. We're not called to treat each other like the world system. Instead, the scripture says here, they were called to not do evil. But see to it that no one repays evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for one another and for all. In fact, Proverbs 27, 17 says that 24, 17 says this. Don't gloat when your enemy falls and don't let your heart rejoice when he stumbles. Galatians 6, 10 says this. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. You know how you can really develop relationships like this? Being involved in the life of the body. That's serving. That's coming to any time something's being taught. That means that, guess what? You're involved. And the more you get involved, the more you get to engage with the life of somebody else. It is hard for you to do that if you come late and leave early. It's hard for you to do that if you never engage or serve. You say, man, if I serve or if I come to these teaching things and all this kind of stuff, it's going to just take away more of my time and I have to deal with people. That's the beauty of being in the body. It's being in a family. So it says, look, we don't repay evil for evil. We seek the good. Because in the Roman world, just as in the Greek world, avenging oneself for wrong done was necessary because the humiliation a Roman's prestige suffered. So in the Roman culture, 
To repay evil was actually what you were called to do. Christ, though, turns that on its head. We see this reality of we're called not to consider revenge, but we're called to instead love, instead do good. And this good is vast. Do good for one another and for all. And look at verse 17 to 18. With all this, live a life of rejoicing in prayer. Look, it says, rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. All right, we've got a few minutes left. Let me walk through this really quickly. Think of how messy life in the church is. Yet, in this end time, he gives us this hyperbole here on prayer. He says, look, rejoice always, pray constantly. Now, if you think about it, this seems humanly impossible to rejoice always in a pray constantly. Like, is he saying to us, like, every moment, like, we'll we be praying, muttering prayers? No, this is not what he's saying here. To pray without ceasing is a life of prayer that takes place outside the four walls. It's our hearts yielded to the Lord daily and our dependence on him alone. And as a people of God, we should be a people of prayer. We should pray when we need, when we don't need, and when we're going through, we should pray for one another. The world, the Bible tells us, is crooked and perverted, and the world complains and grumbles, but this is not the way of the people of God. We rejoice and we pray. Now, unlike pagan prayers, which sought to influence the gods to have favorable disposition towards those who are praying, Christian prayer begins with a confidence of God, who is our Father, who desires us, and who's good to us and calls us his children. We instead rejoice. This is our disposition, and this is what he's saying to us. We rejoice that our names are written in the book of life. We rejoice because we have hope. We have hope in Christ. We rejoice because, guess what? We have strength in Christ. In fact, Romans 8, 31, 32 says this, If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? So our disposition in the body is one of rejoicing. It's one of prayerfulness. And if you wonder what the will of God is, it says it here. Look what it says there in verse 18. Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God's will for us is to be a people that rejoice, a people that are prayerful, a people that live in this way. You say, how do I know I'm in the will of God? There you go right there. This is God's will revealed to us. And so he, he ends with this. In fact, this is not even the end of the very last part of this, but for the sake of time, we're just in here. Look what it says there in verse 19. It says, don't stifle the spirit. Don't despise prophecies, but test all things. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. I love how all this comes together. We're called to have leaders that are godly, leaders that we honor, but also in the body we're called to be interdependent on one another, doing the greatest good for one another, but then also we're called not to quench the Holy Spirit. Born-again believers are filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, we're in a series right now on Wednesday at 645 about the Holy Spirit. You say, when are y'all meeting again? This Wednesday, 645. We're going to talk about God, the Holy Spirit, who comforts. You say, I don't have anything going on on Wednesday. Well, come to church on 645 on Wednesday. The New Testament gives us a view of the Holy Spirit, and it often it's talking about in relation to, to fire often. In Acts 2, we see the Spirit on the day of Pentecost coming as a violent rushing wind. And they saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. So this idea of quenching the spirit is the picture of causing fire to be extinguished. And we see here our need for God, the Holy Spirit, in the body. We see our need here for God, the Holy Spirit, who convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. His role... Part of his role leads us into all truth. And so a healthy body has godly leaders that we're thankful for, the body that's interdependent in doing their work, but then also the Spirit of God moving among us. And we're called not to quench the Holy Spirit. Quenching, as one commentator said, is what you do to the Spirit. Grieving is how he responds to what you did. 
Grieving speaks of the personal anguish of the Holy Spirit when a believer quenches the holy fire that is kindled in their hearts. How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, with our lifestyles, with sinfulness in our hearts, with the things that may be the evil among us in the body of Christ. So why does the apostle say don't stifle the spirit or quench the spirit? Well, we see his role. He's the comforter. He dwells within us and comforts and guides us. Ephesians 4.30 instructs us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. And a couple ways we do this is living opposite, the, uh, uh, living opposite of the will of God, rebelling against the will of God and his way. It's saying the Spirit of God is living and active in the church and saying, no, we're going to follow what we want. So part of the work of the Holy Spirit is speaking what the Lord has said. He tells us here, don't despise prophecy. Essentially, this means not to look down upon or not take seriously. Now, understand, even at this time, many had abused prophecy in the church. At this time, many had abused prophecy in the early church. And the main purpose of Christian prophecy was not to divine the future, but it was for strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. Hear what I'm saying. When we look in the New Testament, Prophetic, the prophetic work of the Spirit of God and working through uh, men and even women, we see this in the, in the New Testament, it was, it was often not for foretelling, meaning telling you what's to come. The working of prophecy was often for strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. But there were problems in more than one congregation with false prophecies. And the measures that were put in place by the church were put in place so that they can discern what was from the Lord and what was not. So this person with the gift of prophecy proclaimed the word of the Lord to the congregation. It was for strengthening and comfort. A word of prophecy could be evangelistic. It could lead to conviction. It could lead to the conversion of unbelievers. And the spirit might be quenched by the prophet himself if he refused to speak the word the spirit gave him. Understand the early church was often focused in on the exhortation and the encouragement piece. In fact, it says this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, 22, test all things, hold on to what is good, stay away from every kind of evil. So the early church tested every word of prophecy. Do we see that today? Yes or no? I'm just asking y'all, do we see that today? Yes or no? No, we don't. Because anybody can get up and say these words. I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying. And you know what the church does? It's like Pavlov's dog. Ding! Ding! And this is how we've been conditioned. We've not been trained to say, no, the Spirit of God did not say that. How do we know this? Well, I'll give you some criteria. Does it line up with the word of God? Does this person acknowledge Christ's full deity and humanity, as well as God's free forgiveness through Christ's death and resurrection? Listen to this one according to Matthew 7, 15 to 23. Does the godly character of the one claiming to be a prophet line up with the character of one who follows Christ? That disqualifies a whole bunch of them right there. Listen to this one. I know we don't like this, but does the result of the prophecy, which should always build up the church in every way, does it come to pass? Yeah, I know I said, no, you just was lying. No, what we have in the word of God is sufficient because I want to put this to you. If someone says they have a revelatory word from God, at what point do we say that revelatory word, is it equal with this or lesser? I mean, honestly, because if I said I hear the Spirit saying, and the Scripture says the Spirit will never lie and will tell you exactly what Jesus has said, and I say, I hear the Spirit saying, well, guess what? I'm saying this, and what I'm saying is on the same level. Don't get mad with me. Get mad with the Bible. That's all I'm saying. 
Because the scripture tells us that the word of God is the only thing that reproves us, rebukes us, and trains us up in righteousness. So, we need the word of the Lord, and we need those who are readily proclaiming this is what God has given us. This is what God has revealed to us. Because why? We have the fulfilled canon. We have the word of God that is sufficient for us today. And we need to stand firm and hear what God is saying to us and what God has given to us and has revealed to us. Because here's the truth. If you look through the New Testament, Although it talks about prophecy and all it talks about these things, we have none of those things recorded. We have none of them. We have what the word of God is. So we'll stick with the word of God. We'll say, God, what do you say? I think the closest thing we probably can see to maybe New Testament prophecy even now would be something like even like a testimony service. Like someone has given an exhortation and encouragement. Right, God is moving on their heart, and they're giving an exhortation and encouragement. We can even test that to say, okay, look, does this line up with the word of God? You know what a role of an elder and an overseer is? If I was sitting there and somebody got up here and said something that was heretical, guess what my role is? Uh, Sit down. No, you, that's embarrassing. Could you imagine I get up and say, church, I want to tell y'all something. What y'all just heard was not from Jesus. Somebody tell me, in the background you came out of, have you ever seen that done? You never will because they want your money. So how do we close with this? Well, here's the first one. Do you have a negative view of the church or a negative view of church leaders that has not allowed you to grow? I get it. There's leaders that have hurt us. There's leaders that have done wrong. But is that stopping you from growing where God has placed you. For some of you, God has placed you here. And this is where God wants you to be. But are you going to take that step to grow? Meaning beginning to build life in the body of Christ. Using your gifts, learning and being equipped, and then also developing relationships with one another. What about this one? Who is God challenging you to build a relationship with? Maybe there's someone in here that God has challenged you and put in your life to build a relationship with. Who is that person? This would be a great time to begin to build that relationship. Maybe it's somebody who needs comfort. Maybe they need uh, encouragement. Maybe they need uh, to be, you know, hey, look, they're a weaker brother in the faith, and you know a little bit more. You can help them along. But who has God challenged you to build a relationship with? And here's the last one. Have you grieved the Holy Spirit? In your life, I'm talking to you if you're a Christian. Now, the unbeliever can blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And how does an unbeliever blaspheme the Holy Spirit? By rejecting Jesus as the only way. That is blasphemy. And if you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit, guess what? There's forgiveness. You can come to faith in Christ. You can come and say, Lord, forgive me. I'm trusting in Jesus. But you, we as Christians can grieve the Holy Spirit by quenching the Spirit's work in our lives and quenching the work of the Spirit in the church. We want to be those who say, Lord, we're following you. Can we bow our heads and close our eyes? Lord, I thank you that this body life is one we should rejoice over, but one that is hard sometimes. And this is why we need your precious spirit to move upon us, to work in us, to convict us of sin, to bring the word of God fully to us that our hearts would be illuminated. Lord, I pray that we would not be those who grieve you with our lifestyles or even how we live among each other in the body of Christ. Lord, lead us, guide us, call us to yourself once again. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I pray that you were blessed by today's worship and the message that you heard. And one of the things that we're very passionate about